Welcome to Compression, the quest to $100 million in just one year. Join me, your host, Logan Freeman, in this one-of-a-kind interactive podcast experience where I am on a quest to compress three years of achievement and production into 12 months. And no, the answer is not to just work harder. I'm bringing you not only ideas and concepts that are complete at the theoretical level, but they're also effective at the applied level. Look guys, knowledge is not power. It is potential power. Knowledge plus massive strategic action equals power. We're talking about strategy, systems, accountability, all in real time. This is Compression. And we're back for another compression episode. Logan was telling me we're at 33.9 Say it again. million dollars. 33.9 million dollars. <laughs> Quite a halfway. But yes. Missing, baby. I love that, man. I love the clap too. That's we're we're getting sophisticated over here at the compression podcast, man. I like it. Leveling up, man. I like that. Makes me feel good. You know, my love language is word of affirmations. So getting that virtual pat on the back feels pretty good right now. I have to say pretty good. So man, we got the intentionality coming up for this week. So there's a few things that we're going to talk about this week. The, the, the first one is accepting critical or constructive feedback in the right way, okay? So that's the first one, is especially when it comes from somebody that's very close to you. <laughs> and so everybody uses that word accountability. What does that actually mean? Well, it's the ability to stay up to date with your accounts, right? Well, who's actually doing that? And you have all of these terms like accountability partners and you know all of this stuff, but at the end of the day, who's really going to give you that feedback? Well, one, it's going to be somebody that you're paying, right? That's, that's because that's their job. And if they're not, and they're making you feel good, then you're just paying for a friend. Okay. I don't pay for friends. The second is probably your spouse or your business partners. And that's what we're going to spend a lot of time on this week, but accepting critical feedback from people that are very close to you, how I actually set accountability up and being coachable is the intentionality this week. Obviously very exciting for uh, a few big closings that happened. Uh, We got through a really tough uh, scenario on a brokerage deal, Um, but it got some crazy good wins, man. I mean, some crazy good wins. And, uh, but I got a, I got a pretty sizable loss as well. And I'm still battling something and we'll, 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 t- we'll dive into that, all of those things today on the Compression Podcast. I promise to everybody listening that I'm not going to cry today. At least I don't think Jerome's going to pull the tears uh, back out of me. But uh, if you didn't listen to last week's, man, I uh, thought a lot about that episode because it's going to, you know, it hasn't been posted yet. But people, I, I wonder how that's going to be, you know, received. I don't care how it's received, but I've never heard anybody else do that on a podcast and it definitely was not planned. So um, I'm in a little different state uh, this week, a little bit different state, uh, mental state, not physical state, because I'm always here in the great state of Missouri and Kansas. But anyways, man, I'm excited to dive in. Where do you want to get started? Oh, I, you talked about the loss and I, I want to go there and then okay. I want to go out on the high note. All right. Okay. So here's a big thing that, uh, I'm battling guys. And Tim Grover talks about this in his book, uh, whatever his book is called. I I always forget the name of that book, but Relentless. um, relentless. He talks about when you get to the cleaner level, it's very difficult to turn it off. Actually, many of the cleaners cannot turn it off. And I'm realizing that I'm not a compressor yet. I'm working to be a compressor because a compressor can compress the time, but they also can compartmentalize what they are doing. That's the big difference between a compressor and a cleaner. Right now, I'm a cleaner. I can't turn it off, guys. I'm, I'm battling this, and I need some, 
I need some help. Um, so I'll give the, I'll lay, I'll lay the land out here and, and we can, we can dive into what's, what's been going on, but you know, I've been holding myself extremely accountable. I've been focused on sustainability. I have been uh, setting goals, achieving them. I have uh, laid out to you guys all these different things on delegation, productivity systems. I'm doing them. I'm reading. I'm talking at a bigger level. I feel like I'm thinking at a way different level than I was, you know, five, six months ago. And that's, it's proving to be successful and it's becoming magnetic, right? And so all these things are manifesting in my life. Well, the big loss comes in to account that I'm in the finance business, right, guys? I talk about money all of the time, and it's just a part of my business. And uh, I have a different relationship with investments and money than most folks do. And so the loss came from a few scenarios where, you know, I was with family, with friends, and they're asking about my business and our business and what we're doing and some of my biggest losses. People want to hear that stuff. And so naturally, I am very authentic. I use numbers. I use figures. And it is coming off. And this is from Taylor. So I take this very uh, seriously. But it is coming off like, um, you know, I am being more cocky than I am just bringing the confidence, right? That fine line between cocky and confidence um, apparently has been crossed. Not apparently. I'll take ownership of it. It has been crossed because it's come up multiple times. And so you know, I think that what's difficult for me is when I get in social scenarios, I get around people that aren't in the finance business, real estate business, where we use, you know, the millions and, and, and that a lot. Um, it's, it's coming off in a way that it, it feels like I'm not being humble. And so, um, you know, I got that feedback earlier today, uh, a little bit earlier uh, last, you know, earlier this week as well. My wife even went to the, to the extent of saying arrogant, and I, that's not me. That's not who I am. She knows that. It's the way that I'm speaking about things uh, because it's what I do on a regular basis. And I have not been able to turn necessarily that off. And more and more people have asked me about our business. They see compression, you know, the quest to $100 million. They see the podcast episodes. And, um, you know, I've, I've, so I dive into that stuff, but it's coming off in a way that I'm, I'm, I'm coming off more arrogant than I am. And I can't turn the, you know, the uh, cleaner mentality off and actually meet people where they are. And so, you know, I just, uh, I don't know, I'm struggling with understanding what I can do to actually, um, you know, remedy this, this scenario, because my wife sent me a text earlier that said, you know, humility plus confidence is the sexiest thing a man can ever have. And, uh, and so for me, that was like, okay, well, how do I implement humility with a confidence, but not come off arrogant or cocky? And that's the loss. I'm going to stop, pause right there, and let's dive into this thing. You just open up Pandora's box, my brother. This is going to be probably the whole episode, but this is, yep. so was, there's a couple of things, and these things are challenges, I think, for everybody who's playing at a high level. Anytime you are dealing with someone who has some hangups, some um, shame around what they're doing, right? It may not feel big enough. It may not, they may not make the type of money. They may um, not have the relationship they want. There's some ego, there's some pride. There, there's some pause, hesitation, frustration about somebody who does the thing, right? Mm -hmm. And isn't afraid or ashamed to talk about the thing, especially if it's asked. Yeah. I think, you know, just taking any opportunity that you can in order to tell people about the thing can be challenging, right? right? It can be because you want to throw the number, you want to name drop. Those are the things that happen pretty regularly for somebody who is, you know, showboating, a peacocking, right? Right. right. Um, here is, I think, the challenge that you will always have because of your development officer, mm -hmm. right? You drive revenue. Right. That's what you do. And the only way that you're able to do that is if people know what you do and the level that you do it at so that they're ready yep. to participate. Exactly. Right? And if you don't do that, if you play humble, and this is part of my hangup with religion, 
mm-hmm. because of the the rituals that we end up with when we go there because we don't tell people what we do and what we have because you know we're taught that those things aren't important but as a business owner if people don't know what you do yep. and at what level you do it they can't help you right and your whole job as an evangelist for FTW mm-hmm. compression and everything else is to go out and tell the world about the thing. Right. And if somebody asks you, you have a prepackaged response to that question because it's what you've done for all this time. And it is your biggest priority outside of your family. Right. Safe, yep. Right. I mean, it is number three on the board. Mm-hmm. So the question may be, is the person who had that feeling based on their interaction with you feeling that way because of what you said or because of what they're doing? Yeah. One, two, are they a potential partner for you in that space? And if they aren't, would a potential partner for you in the space that you're speaking about be have the same reaction? Right. And if the avatar, because it doesn't matter what we're doing, we always need to be messaging to our avatar. Mm-hmm. We will, if we're meaningful, and I forget who I was listening to the other day, but basically the conversation went something along these lines. Everybody who is titan of industry, everybody who is thought leader, they are polarizing. Mm-hmm. people have a reaction when they hear the name right either i love this person or i don't like him my man gc is a great example absolutely you either love grant cardone and you know defend him to the end of the world or they say man that guy's a wackadoo i can't get with his style he's just over the top yep and so being and this is the takeaway i think being lukewarm is the fastest way to get thrown out. Right. Right. I think you need to be ice cold or fiery hot. That's what people are looking for. And that's the only way you're going to cut through the noise. Now, can you be obnoxious with some of this stuff? You can. Is it appropriate in every setting to talk about the thing? I don't know what the answer to that question is, Logan, because there are so many situations where that may be your only interaction with the person. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. And that person may go out into the world and interact with somebody if they're not your avatar, interact with somebody who is your avatar. Yep. And based on their interaction with you and their understanding of what you do, they will either put the two of you together or you will be forgotten about completely into oblivion. And I believe I didn't feel this way when I started in entrepreneurship. But I believe that when people leave you, they should feel a way. They should yeah. have an opinion. They, riding the fence is for employees. It's not for owners, right? You set the temperature in the room or the temperature gets set for you. And I think you want to be a thermostat. Just measuring the temperature and then trying to acquiesce or dress appropriately, that's not your game, right? right. Your game is... Here's tempo, here's pace, and we're going to do it here. Yep. And if you're not comfortable with that, then you can either elevate your game or you can leave. And that may sound harsh, but everybody can't play at the level. And it may sound dismissive, but I don't think we're here to play K and play to people who may not be in the same space. And so bow on the present is the person who was offended the person that you want to receive your message and if so i, I took some took some notes on that and, and the idea or kind of let me give some more color um at least my thoughts on it uh, i completely agree about the polarizing piece especially when you are marketing and you're out there, you have to stand out and either you're in one camp or the other. And if you're in the middle, bye-bye. You know, the best of the best always have done that. Neil Bawa, Hunter Thompson, 
you know, Grant Cardone, you know, I mean, Jeff Bezos, Steve Jobs, all of them, polarizing people. So I agree with that. What I'm trying to, to dive into a little bit more is, and I, I texted this to Taylor earlier, was, you know, I think the demon, uh, which has inside of me, which maybe we'll label it something different here when we're done, but the demon or what's driving me is, you know what, my love language is word of affirmations. And sometimes when I'm talking, it feels good to me to, to verbalize the success and the overcoming adversity that we have. And I think it's ingrained deeply in me because I have been through what I have been through in, in my, in my past. And so, you know, everybody asks me, uh, or not everybody, but a lot of people ask me, what are you, what are you afraid of? You know, what is your biggest fear in life? Well, one, my now, my new fear is, you know, doing something or something happening where I obviously lose my, my family, but it, up to that point, it has been, you know, been, I, you know, my biggest fear in life is being mediocre. Okay. Falling into the same, you know, uh, mental camp or perspective that many people that I know have, and even my own, my own father or other folks that have been very close to me. And so that's kind of my driving internal intrinsic motivation, so to speak, or inspiration. That being said, something I study quite often is, you know, what is your purity of intention? Meaning the statement that I'm about to make, am I saying it to, you know, try to be peacocking or try to get that feeling, that dopamine rush of what it feels like to tell somebody? Or am I just getting a point across and, and trying to clearly communicate? And for me, I think a couple of times this week, it, that demon popped up and my purity of intention was not uh, what it should have been. And I think that's where, you know, maybe Taylor saw a few things that in the past, I've, I've taken the same question in a different way and got my same point across uh, to somebody that had asked me that question, but in a, a much more... Um, you know, finesse way, right? Using using finesse instead of just being blunt uh, and just kind of going right at it. So my takeaway from what you said is, you know, think through what my purity of intention is and, and you know, where I'm getting that word of affirmation. And if I'm not getting what I need from internally or somebody that's close to me, like, like my wife, I need to verbalize that instead of internalizing it. And so I did. And she said, um, something that gave me very, you know, very great peace right before we got on the call. She said, that's my job. That's my job. It's not your job to go pat yourself on the back and tell people about it to get that feeling. That's my job. She took extreme ownership of that. And that gave me peace, you know, but I think what happened was, you know, I did not verbalize what I was needing, um, you know, internally, and so it popped out, right? I mean, hey, whatever you're holding in at some point, Freud, you know, the Freudian slip is going to come. And I had some Freudian slips this week, you know, to give me that feeling, that juice, that, uh, you know, hey, you're doing the right thing. And so at the end of the day, um, I think that now I'm much more clear just from listening to you, uh, reviewing some of the things that my wife told me, talking to her on the phone. Um, going back to the purity of intention, walk the walk so you don't have to talk the talk and just, you know, embodying what I what I'm feeling internally. But also, if I'm not necessarily feeling like what I'm getting, uh, what I need and, and nobody's filling my cup up, I need to tell people that uh, I fill a lot of other people's cups up on a regular basis. And I I um, I utilize myself to, you know, turn the faucet on quite a bit. But um, I realize if you listen to last week, how much that fills me up when I do get that. And she has been doing it. I just have not been, I have not been uh, aware enough to see it. I'm moving so fast. Uh, we're going, we're doing things that I just need to, to, to slow down a little bit and, and just, uh, you know, what, what do they say? Smell the roses, you know, I just got to <laughs> smell the roses, you know, you gotta so be present, man, that's you right. gotta be present. But the, the question then becomes if, if you know that that's the way you're loved, then how do you get that programmed in kind of like what you you're doing already, right? You're doing coffee for her. You're helping in the morning. I mean, of course, people say, hey, you're supposed to help, whatever. There's a lot of guys who don't. They just yep. leave it for her to figure out. 
you're doing the flowers like that stuff's you know kind of automated it's part of the process this is what we do that's right so how can you get some of those systems set up and you're only doing it because she enjoys it it's not because it's a thing for you it's i want to please her i want to show her that i care i want to show her that she's special to me and i'm willing to make this sacrifice so what can we do how can we get this piece automated or systematized for you so that you know, outside of something extraordinary happening, that you're getting that fill. Because I will tell you, you know, and I, I don't talk about it a whole lot, but I believe there's three F's to a happy man in a relationship, right? Yep. I won't use the last one, but flattery <laughs> and feed are the two of the three, right? Yes. And I think if a guy isn't getting the three, then he'll go find it eventually. Mm -hmm. And I think the one that is toughest, especially for women that have alpha energy is the flattery. Right. Right. It's you're supposed to flatter me. I don't flatter or admire you. That is because I'm here, right? My presence signals that, you know, you're impressive, you're important. And so this is how kind of the assistant kind of slips in there, right? It's, oh, man, you're so impressive. You're so good. You're, you do all these things well, and you get drawn away because you're getting that cup filled there instead of the other place. And then other things happen. But all they had to do was fill up that cup. And, right. you know, there's usually some ego play in there and why that doesn't happen. But if you can systematize that piece, I think you end up in a really good space where you don't have to worry about that happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's an ask. And I guess the other piece is just saying, hey, I, I'm not feeling it. Am I doing the right things? Am I okay? Um, that doesn't feel good. That feels yeah. needy, right? But um, yeah, I want you to tell me I did good. Like, I want you to appreciate it. And I'll tell you, like, I, I know for a fact, like, I've been through that where, you know, I was in a situation where the person knew that I wanted their approval. And they wouldn't give me their approval because they knew they could make me do other things if I felt like they didn't approve of what I was doing. And so that level of control is terrifying yeah. for a person because you can't self-soothe. And you know, the last story I'll tell here is, you know, when Kaya was small, she sucked her thumb to soothe herself. She was a self-soother. She didn't need a pacifier. She didn't need a bottle. She didn't need food. She didn't even need to be held. She suck her thumb and she would be good to go. Well, when she was trying to crawl, she would get frustrated, put her thumb in her mouth. So now she couldn't go anywhere because she only had one hand and two legs, right? <laughs> yeah. So she's so now she's getting even more frustrated because she's trying to soothe herself, but she wants to crawl. And it's like, ah, which one do I do? And so eventually she had to take the thumb out the mouth to move. And so all of that to say, how can we, how can we get ourselves in a situation where we have the infrastructure around us so that we don't have to self-soothe? And then we can immediately be in a space where we're just focusing on helping and soothing those around us. And it, that, I think, is utopia, my friend. Yes. Well, you just dropped some absolute bombs right there. Uh, A new mental model, the three F's, okay? And this hit me big right then and there. And I want to dive into this. One, I won't dive in too much, but I did just send my wife a text message and say, I need you. Uh, Something happened this week where we we couldn't keep our scheduled uh, necessarily routine, um, you know, on on a hump day, everybody knows my Wednesdays are hump day, um, getting over the hump, eating tacos and spending time together. Unfortunately, we didn't uh, do that. So that was the biggest one that um, maybe some things are coming out for me because I was not able to, to uh, use that third F this week. So that's, I know we're kind of getting down the, the rabbit hole a little bit, but we'll leave that at that. The second piece is, okay, when she has sent me those messages, you know, I snooze them in my Gmail. So they pop up every once in a while. That's not, that's not working. What I need to do is create my Monday board and have a task with all of the updates. And whenever I'm feeling a little bit like I need my cup filled up, go read 
the words that she has said over and over and over again. And I put that on my task list, put that on my notes. I'm very excited about that. Um, more to come on this. I think we, I think we, I think we, you know, solved it. I know what I got to go do. And um, I verbalized it to her and I also put it on my task list. So stay tuned on that. Uh, you're a master Jay. I appreciate that. Uh, that was a big loss for this week, but you know, a big learning is what we just talked about. So you never know what you're going to get here on the compression podcast, but it's all about sustainability here. Uh, that's all we're talking about. And uh, you know, frankly, I'm not trying to get to the top of the mountain by myself. You know, I'm trying to get there with all my friends and all my family and, and uh, it's all about sustainability. And, you know, when you think about high performance, we've talked about this, but your personal life has got to be in check, man. I mean, it just has to be. And this is another reminder of that. So uh, you want to get into some, you want to get into some wins from, from this past week? That's, I mean, it only goes up from here, my friend. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll dive into some of these and I got some cool learnings too, that I want to share with, uh, with everybody, but um, okay. The first one is this, right? Use leveragers. Okay. And leveragers. So first off, I'm going to put everybody up on game. All right. If you do not have Ray Dalio's principal app on your phone, this is the best free thing that you can ever do. That man could charge $39.99 a month across probably millions of people and have a new revenue stream. But he's giving this stuff away because he's in his a part of his life that um, that he just wants to pass this knowledge on. I respect this gentleman uh, dearly. I read Principles big thick book a couple of years ago. I didn't get any of it. I didn't get any of it. And no, now, no. I, I was like, like, what is this? What thing? is this Why guy talking crazy? about? What is he talking about? <laughs> But now I'm, I'm, I, I, you know, I leveled up my intellectual curiosity and my level. And so, you know, anyways, that app is incredible, guys. There's a coach kind of functionality where you can, um, you know, you can make your own principles. You can save the ones that he has. The book is on there for free. Uh, it has a reminder every day to check out the, uh, check out one of the principles. It's just a great way to implement. I mean, it's incredible. I would love to have the compression app uh, someday like this, but it's, it's a great resource. So it just puts you up on game. Go download that. Take the free personality uh, assessment. It takes a lot of time, but it's it's worth it. Um, but anyways, one of the principles that he talks about is using leveragers, which are people who can go from conceptual to practical effectively and do the most to get your concepts implemented. And, and the biggest learning that I've had this week is I had success utilizing leveragers over the past two weeks. And it's very, very exciting because one of the big things of, of leveraging, right, is, okay, we talk about high value tasks a lot. We talk about low value tasks a lot and how to operate more on revenue generating activities. Well, I have shifted everything to Monday, but Monday is no, not just a task organizer. It's a delegation system for me. And we'll talk about this part later. It captures my ideas. Okay, so two of my top 10 talents are learner and input. Meaning I, I'm always taking in information, but with the other end of that is input. I got to put it somewhere or I can't do anything else. And so I have to be able to put this information somewhere. And David Allen with Getting Things Done talks about this a lot, uh, but I've got my system down and I'm, I'm being able to put my information somewhere. I'm letting it go. I know where it's at. I can go get it. It's, it's organized, super excited about that. So I'm leveraging intellectual um, intellectual capital by the, the ability to organize it in a way where I can go find it, share it, whatever I want to do. So very excited about that. But the second piece is using people who can take my ideas and actually go implement. And so this happened on a couple fronts this week. I have 22 podcasts to uh, schedule. I realized I was letting them, and one of them is yours, my friend. And I, I was continuing to let them pile up and say, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. And I realized um, after I put it on my task list and labeled it as procrastinating is why am I procrastinating? Well, the task seems too big. I do not want to get on 15, 25 different calendar links and try to do that. Okay. I don't have to, I've got people to help me with that. Now created a whole delegation system with all of my, uh, scheduling. So there, there's about 20 podcasts and about 25 other either in-person or calls that needed to be scheduled and worked through it with our team to, 
to be able to handle all of those uh, capacity, you know, give me my capacity back by handling all of those scheduling pieces. The second one is, okay, very excited to tell you guys this, but, you know, we brought on our acquisitions associate, Jordan, he's doing a great job. And uh, up to this point, he's been here for about five or six weeks. It's been, okay, let me understand, you know, how to underwrite. Let me figure out who the players are in the market. Uh, so we've been underwriting all of the on-market deals. Well, the trend that I'm seeing is higher competition this year already. All right. So we don't have anything under contract right now. So, well, what do we need to do? Okay. We just closed the deal out in Kansas City, Kansas. The best way, in my opinion, to get, uh, you know, deals after you close a deal is call everybody in that area that owns the deal and says, hey, I just closed a 50 unit deal. We're looking to expand our footprint. And so we role played on the phone, how he would talk to these property owners, how, what, you know, what are the objections he's going to get? How is he going to, you know, uh, react to those? And so we created a, you know, we're creating our sales document, kind of our sales training document that says anybody that's going to come on and start driving deal flow can go to this document and have canned responses, you know, put them in your own words, that's fine, but canned responses to that. So we did that uh, last week, this week. And I said, okay, this week, man, it's time to get on the phones. And guess what? He got on the phones and uh, made 20 or 30 dials, uh, which isn't a huge amount. We're, you know, habit stacking this bad boy. And guess what? We got two new off-market deals. You know, I, I don't know if they'll go under contract, but we're not talking to brokers on them. Uh, we're talking to the property owners. And uh, I know you're a big proponent of focusing on direct to seller and getting this acquisition strategy and then the actual system put in place is a huge leverager for me. I drive capital and I drive deals. Those are my two most valuable priorities in our business. Okay. And the way that I do that is, yes, I have great strategy. I'm a good communicator. Um, you know, I could talk to people, all of that, have good relationships, but I, to, to take that to the next level, to um, have it to the second power, so to speak, I need to use leveragers. And so spending time with Jordan so he can hear how I'm reacting and responding, how I'm thinking about it, where I'm taking the communication. Now I don't have to necessarily do that. I need to stay involved and be coaching him uh, to continue to get better. But uh, that was a huge leverager that's going to drive a massive amount of revenue for our, our company because this week alone, I raised $875,000 for no deal. For no deal, <laughs> a phantom deal said, Hey, Logan, uh, I got 500 K. I'm not really looking with any other operators. I want to be in Kansas city with you. Hey, Logan, um, really excited about what you're doing. Love the action plan that you guys put out. I got hundred K. Hey, Logan, next time you got a deal, can you call me before it goes to your webinar? So I don't miss out four different times that happened this week. I have no deal. So I'm doing a good job driving the revenue from the capital raising side. That's almost a result of all of the things that I'm doing on a regular basis. It's not one thing that drives that per se, or I haven't put my finger on what that one thing is. The second one is, okay, got to have somewhere to put that, put that capital. Here's the deal. We are not willing to change our underwriting uh, structure and our underwriting principles just because the market is changing. So if we're not changing that, what do I have to change? I need to change the velocity of deal flow that's coming into our pipeline. And I also have to talk to investors and say, hey, last year was an interesting year. It was COVID-19. Nobody else was buying. That's why our returns were 300 to 400 basis points higher than maybe what you're going to see on our next deals. It doesn't mean that it's a bad deal. It just means it's a different deal because of the timing. We're not changing our underwriting. We're not juicing rents. We're not changing our reversion cap rates. None of it. What we are doing is talking to you and saying, hey, I know you saw 18, 19, 20, 21, 22% last year. We're going to be talking about 15, 16, 17s uh, this year. And here's why. And so it's an anchoring bias, right? So they've anchored in the sense that, hey, last year I saw your deals at 18, 19, 20. Yeah. And those filled up like this or they didn't. And it was really difficult. You should have got in then. The underlying principles and mechanism of commercial real estate is still great as an investment strategy. So my question to them is, what are you comparing it to? What's your anchor? And then what else are you going to do with your dollars? And man, I tell you what, that talk, that talk track, when I walk people through that model and that action plan that helps them understand those 10 critical success you know, growth factors that we've identified, 
is ringing a bell with people. And so anyways, that's all to say that using leveragers is how I'm going to grow this, right? So we're, we're c- closing in on the $100 million mark of, of assets under management this year. We will get there. We're closing in on the $100 million just in general with the compression. But if I'm honest with myself and I think about a guy like Ray Dalio or Howard Marks, who I texted you about just raised 17 billion and you say, I can't count that high. I don't even know how many zeros that is. I, don't, I can't count that <laughs> high either. But what are they doing? What did Sam Zell do to raise $497 you know, million? He used leveragers. They use leveragers and it's your imprint out there. I think of it like the, uh, what are those... Um, 3D printers, you know, I'm creating little Logan Freeman 3D printers out there. You know, they're just printing off, hey, here's, here it is in the acquisition side. Here it is on the marketing side. Here it is over there. And you have to be able to do that. You have to be able to get people to see how you're seeing it, coach them up and then get them out in the world and get them inspired. And now I'm understanding how business is actually created. I never understood this in my master's program. I wish somebody would have told me these things way back when, but maybe I wouldn't have taken note of them like I have now. So a huge learning this this week is using leveragers. So somebody wants to get Logan Freeman's time, what do you got to do? Well, if you're going to send me an email, it's going straight to Crystal and Lisa. They got the Calendly links. It's probably four or five, six weeks out is what it is. You know, I, I just don't I don't have the ability to, to make that changes unless you're very special and I'll, I'll make a change for you. But at the end of the day, I applied leverage to our acquisition strategy. I've applied leverage to the onboarding strategy of new investors with the action plan. I no longer am touching them until they're ready. Huge win. Uh, it's been a big project that, that uh, we're talking about. And then I'm using, I'm using leverage in, in relation to scheduling my time, taking care of you know, calling vendors, stuff that I should not uh, have been doing, and I've got a system for it. And I'm feeling very pumped up about it. So huge learning, huge win. That's amazing, man. I, and this is not working harder, right? This is getting to the hundred million without working harder, just working harder. You're multiplying yourself. You're creating more time and space. So the, the next thing I want to talk about guys is, all right, I was walking around the neighborhood fixing up my uh, my E on the savers, my exercise, which, you know, is typically getting out and, and walking and breathing that fresh air, getting out of my my home office where Jerome has been before. It's it's a great office, but, you know, from four to 6.30, it's two and a half hours sitting in that same seat as my watch is telling me, get up and move, man, come on. And so I'm getting up and moving and, and I'm breathing the fresh air, listening to the birds, got my podcast going and uh, something hit me. It was the third time I've listened to the same podcast episode because man, oh man, I just, uh, I, I'm just, and I'm not going to say it because everybody knows who it is, but it's Marks Acosta Rubio. And, and I guess I did say it. So eh, there you go. Uh, but this episode that you put me on, on game with, with, with the hustle and flow chart guys, I just, it's just blowing me. My, my, every time I listen to it, I hear something new and it's just, uh, it's exciting, but this was what, th- this is what it was. It was okay. Last Two weeks ago, we talked about the four things you can't delegate, stole that from Marx, modeled it from Marx, whatever. He probably modeled it from somebody else. Four things that you can do to either start, stop, do more, do less. Same thing, Marx. But this one, it was like, okay, in your business, what are you actually paid for? And, And as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, you're paid for brilliance. You are paid for brilliance, meaning it's the intersection when you have an idea and what you need, when you know what you need to do. So again, it's the intersection of the idea and what you know you need to go do. It's this moment where ner- two neurons kind of connect and you're like, ding, 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 ding. That's it. That's it. You're not paid for actually going and doing it. Okay. You are not paid to actually go do it. What do I mean? Well, what, here's, here's the thing. You have a great idea about a new action plan, a new webinar, a new speaking engagement, a new book, a new blog, all of those things. That's where the brilliance is created. That is where the money is made, not actually doing the work. Yes, you need a system for getting the work done. But when your inputs are not tied to your outputs is when you focus on brilliance. When your inputs are not tied to your outputs, it's because you're focused on brilliance. And that's why somebody will hire somebody for $20,000 for one day just to come in and create brilliance that they're not seeing. 
That happens on a regular basis. You want Tony Robbins on the phone? You want Jay Abraham on the phone? Great. You got an hour? $20,000. Wire it to me beforehand. No refunds. That's the brilliance. So you got to find where that brilliance is. And the only way that you do that is connecting ideas and frameworks in your own mind. So uh, Charlie Munger calls it synthesizing. Okay, so when you take one model, you combine it with a new another model, and then you put them together. It's synthesizing. That's where the brilliance is created. And Anthony Vecino is doing an cr- incredible job breaking stuff down on on LinkedIn. That dude's on fire. So shout out to Anthony. I don't know if you're you're listening. I know you got a new deal. Good luck, man. Call me if you need any any help. But at, at the end of the day, man, he's breaking it down for people to understand. And I commented on that. And I said, hey, you're talking about brilliance right here. And uh, a lot of people were like, oh, I like that. You know, uh, I did not make that up. I stole that from Mr. Marx or Costa Rubio. But at the end of the day, understanding that when you synthesize and you're taking one thing, combining it with another one and creating something new, that's where you're paid for not to actually go implement the work. And so this, this idea, concept of brilliance and leveragers combined is where you not only have magnitude, you have the multitude because you're not tied to doing everything. Huge learning lesson for me. Can't wait to continue to to figure out how to do that on a regular basis. But I think the first way is capturing all these ideas that I have. Prime example. So talked at the theoretical level to you guys there for a while. Let's talk at the applied level so you understand a takeaway. Jerome and I are texting yesterday, I think it was. And, um, you know, I wanted to go put a bunch of ad spin behind, you know, this new new action plan that I've got. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, hey, you, you got the ability... Uh, with your network, with your audience, with what you can do to go drive traffic to this organically without spending $5,000 a month, whatever it is, $10,000 a month. And you can test this thing out, okay? We'll make tweaks on it. We'll make it better. And then we can pour the gasoline on it. Oh, oh, and by the way, you know, you should probably make two or three new talk tracks and go on the podcast or, oh, oh, and by the way, there's probably a passive investor conference focused just on this, on how you can do a 12 unit deal and a 426 unit deal in the same year. And it still makes sense. Oh, oh, and, and by the way, you also need to talk about controlling deal flow and controlling the inflow of, of capital into your business. And that's what you should do. That's brilliance, guys. That is brilliance. So I took that idea, put it right back up on my Monday. I have to go aggregate all the things that we have talked about keep them in a document so I know what to work on. I I wanted to try to figure out, okay, what is a strategic marketing plan? So what do I do? I go buy a book. Okay. I got the one page marketing plan book coming to my house. I don't know when it's going to be there, but I'm excited to dive into it because I need one page. I need one page and, and it tells me exactly what I need to do. I need to create brilliance with Jerome in a masterminding session, put that brilliance down on a strategic marketing plan, look at it for 12 months and just do the thing and not worry about marketing at all. Just do the thing, right? So anyways, that's all to say that's that's the effective uh, level. And that idea right there will drive 250 to 350 to $500,000 into our business. And why, why do you, you know, why does everybody ask, well, why do you have people that are helping you? There you go. You know, Jerome texted me the, <laughs> Joan texted me yesterday. And if you don't find value in that, it's because you don't see it and uh, you're not thinking at that level. That's not a, I'm not downplaying anybody, but if you don't respect the ability to bounce ideas off of somebody else and have that actually be implemented. And oh, Jerome also saved me 120 grand from going and spending it on ads before that I know the thing converts, you know? But that's that's all about it. I mean, Jerome texted me some of the results from one of his uh, other coaching clients and it's just astronomical. Your return on investment. Okay, let's talk about this real quickly. I'm just going on a rant here, but I can either go invest money into a real estate deal. Yes, that's good. Create your passive income. It's important. I can take that same $25,000, $50,000, invest it back into this. What is my, in, in this, what we're doing right now, what is my ROI on that? Well, you can't figure that out necessarily. Sure, you can, but that's the hardest thing everybody tries to ever quantify is when you're trying to quantify the qualitative, it's difficult. Okay, but we just talk through ways that 
You know, Jerome saved our company 120 grand from not doing advertising, probably driving 350 to $500,000 because when I go on these 22 podcasts, I'm going to know what to talk about. I'm going to know exactly what to say. I'm going to take them through the brand script of what these three big problems that our investors are seeing right now, lack of clarity, low returns, and uh, high risk, right? All these things. And that's going to drive people right to that action plan. And then we're going to make tweaks on that action plan to make sure it converts even better. And then we're going to tweak it some more. And then I'm never going to have to do an email uh, to a new investor that comes into our business and spend five hours. Well, what do I value my time at right now? $750 an hour. So there you go. There's another $2,200. I can keep going on and on and on. It's just what you have to understand is when you're, you're thinking about concepts, you know, it's difficult to get those concepts out of your head and into your business. That's what we're talking about here, guys. That's compression. If you just lost, I lost you there for the last three minutes, listen to that 15 times because I'm going to, because I'm putting the best of my thoughts right now into this episode. I'm going to go slow this down and listen to this three or four times as a reminder. That's what I try to get out on paper on a regular basis, but it never, you know, we do these on Fridays for a reason because I take the last four or five days that I've been doing all of this stuff, take some time, an hour before this to get ready and then an hour during this because I never know what's going to come out. I used to be worried, what are we going to talk about? We could talk about, well, I don't know. I think this is what we're going to talk about. We don't talk about any of that. And that's okay because this is what we need to talk about. And so if, if you get something out of this, it's to understand how to use leveragers, go download the principles app, call Jerome, see if he can dive into your business. He doesn't have time though. So good luck trying to get on his calendar, <laughs> but focus on that brilliance. And if, if that didn't make sense, go back and listen to that three or four times. Like I said, I'm going to as well. So Anyways, man, that's the learnings that I wanted to drop. I got some other stuff, you know, but that's that's the core of what everything has been driving up to this week. Yeah, I mean, and the funny part is once you learn how to drive the traffic through the social media engagement that you've been building for the past two years, right, the following you've been building, you get to do that over and over and over again so it's not just you know i bought this thing and now i got this thing it's i can apply this against that problem and you know he what he calls brilliance i call pattern recognition there you go okay i'm writing that down yeah i call it pattern recognition and it's like i see that you can do this and it allows you to take the way that a problem was solved and i don't know if you listened to the jay abraham thing i sent you yet or not yeah i did but you know you take the problem that was solved over here and you come in and you apply it over there, right? Mm-hmm. And use the same strategy. You got to tweak the variables a little bit, but you understand the frame with which this works. Yes. And if you are able to move stuff from one place to the other and implement it better and faster than all of your counterparts, you got the strategic and competitive advantage in a way that people are going to be asking questions after they see the results, after they looked at you and said, that guy's a wacko. Like nobody mm-hmm. does it that way. There's a <laughs> good. <laughs> exactly. Good. That's what I like to say to that. Good. And leave it there. Just like old Jocko does. All right, man, we dropped some serious knowledge. I don't want to even add anything else to it. Maybe some of this other stuff will, will pop over. We didn't even talk about most of my, most of my wins, but we got to the, we got to the, to the core concept. I'm thinking clearly. Uh, but I'll leave everybody with this, man, unless you got some other thoughts. I'm going to leave everybody with, uh, you know, a quote that's uh, hitting me hard right now. And uh, one that <clears throat> one that I want to make sure that I share with everybody. You ready for this? I was going to hope you were going to say a quote. I'm, I'm, I have no idea where this is going. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> I hope this is like the, the people's favorite parts of the episode and they get to hear from drake and last week's episode how i just butchered the quote like five times you know like that what was i even i couldn't even read last week i was just a mess but anyways okay so this is from abigail van buren and i sent this to our buddy old robin Drake earlier this this day today and he he emailed me back in two seconds and said i absolutely love that and once he did i knew exactly that i could i could say that this was the right quote for today because robin's uh the preeminent expert on being able to size people up. And so um, long story short, the best index to a person's character is A, how he treats people who can't do him any good, and B, how he treats people who can't fight back. 
And I want somebody at the end of the day to say, hey, that guy had character because he treated people with respect and dignity all of the time, no matter what was going on. And this reigned true because I'm reading a new book by Bo Beery, which um, if you're in the commercial real estate space, I think it's a pretty good book so far. But he talks about your reputation is everything. It is the most important part of your business. Well, how do you build good reputation? It's through character. It's through treating people right. And when you think about how you treat people who can't do you any good, meaning you can't get anything back from them or they can't fight back, that's the true colors when they come out. So that's what I'm gonna leave everybody else with is make sure you're treating people who can't do you any good the way that you would want to be treated. And same goes with people who can't fight back. You never wanna be a bully. You don't wanna come off there again, like I have uh, earlier this week. Go create some brilliance. Jerome, do you have any closing thoughts? I don't. This was outstanding. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite episodes so far. Three Fs, baby. Three Fs. Had some light bulb moments during this. 33.9. Tune in next week for a huge jump, a massive jump, a big leap, a quantum leap. We'll call it even quantum. I like that word. Quantum leap. It's going to be a big one. I'm excited to hear people's reactions to how I went from this number to that number and where our pipeline is. If you like the compression podcast, go leave us a review, go share it with somebody. I'm not here to, to get all the reviews in the world. We're here to be raw, authentic, and bring you lessons every single week because this is my learning grounds, guys. If, if I did anything else in my week that was more important than this, I'd like somebody to tell me. So this was huge. Thank you so much, Jerome. 33 Point nine. Tune in next week. We got a big jump coming. Hey, compressors. If something you heard struck you, made you feel a little bit uncomfortable, good. Head on over to compressionpodcast.com. And then you can also subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast at. If you feel inclined to, please leave us a review. It's obviously helpful. But instead... I'm going to call you out today. I'm going to call you out and make sure that you do your part sharing this message by sharing it with one person that might need to hear what we talked about today. Be great. Nothing else pays.